So I'd like to thank everyone for being here. This is a WWHM 2012 workshop. We're going to be going over basics of modeling. A lot of people have questions about chamber modeling uh, recently. So we're going into chambers. We're going to be modeling with some Princeton Hydro Store chambers and going over flow duration. What is the criteria we need to meet in Western Washington and take some questions as well. So this is a just workshop that hopefully will be informative for everyone. Everyone can kind of just relax, take any information, ask some questions. So who are we? We're Clear Creek Solutions. We were founded all the way back in 2005 by Joe Brasher and Doug Byerline. Uh, I'm Joseph Brasher Jr., uh, EIT. Um, my father and Doug Byerline started the company. Uh, we specialize in software development, hydrology solutions, and stormwater modeling. There's 60 plus years of experience between uh, the senior members. And we developed uh, chiefly the WWHM 2012 for the counties of Western Washington, um, as well as numerous software packages that are being used uh, along the West Coast that utilize continuous simulation hydrology. So that is our background there. So what is, excuse me, there we go. So what is the background of WWHM 2012? Well, the uh, WWHM 2012 is a continuous simulation software package. So unlike anything maybe you were taught in college or if utilized before, which is typically a single event, uh, stormwater software or equation. Continuous simulation relies on the engine, which is called HSPF, which is uh, Hydrologic uh, uh, Program Fortran, which is the engine for WWHM 2012. It allows us to utilize over 60 plus years of rainfall data and information to then model the entire hydrologic cycle. So as opposed to something you're used to where, well, we have a stormwater event and we have a return event, that's going to give us a volume and then we can model our facility based on that. Continuous simulation actually is modeling through time steps this entire hydrologic cycle. And so it allows us to get a better picture of what's going on in our environments. And so instead of modeling a facility just for volume or something like that, we're actually modeling our facility to meet a flow duration, to meet a flow frequency standard because it is more applicable to how weather and how rainfall acts here in Western Washington. So we use this model to size stormwater facilities. We can use it to perform water quality analysis. Um, and it relies on that 60 plus years of rainfall data and that 15 minute time step. So what are the Department of Ecology's minimum requirements when it comes to stormwater, right? Uh, this is if you're designing a project, if you're involved in project design in Western Washington, you're probably very familiar with these at this point. I'm sorry, I'm just going to put those links in the chat one more time so everyone can see them there. Um, there's nine minimum requirements, right? WWHM is focused on helping you meet the three different minimum requirements, but there's minimum requirement one, which is a stormwater site plan. Minimum requirement two, which is your construction uh, parameters there. Uh, minimum requirement number three is your source control pollution, preservation of natural drainage systems. Five is on-site stormwater management. And then, of course, as we get into uh, six, seven, and eight, runoff treatment, seven is flow control, eight is wetlands protection, and number nine is operation and maintenance. So you can, I just put a link in the chat there, you can download the stormwater manual, the Western Washington stormwater manual. If you guys are involved in modeling, I'm sure you're all very familiar uh, with this at this point. So, um, but I put the link in the chat there if you want to take a look at that. This is where we derive our standards uh, for the model. So WWHM 2012 helps you meet Minimum requirements six, seven, and eight. So it's a model that you can then use to meet those requirements on your project, make it easy for you to do that. And so the different requirements that can help you meet is one of them is minimum requirement number six, which is runoff treatment, right? Which meeting that 91% a filtered threshold. Bioretention is often used for that. We're not going to go into that in this uh, workshop here. What we're concerned about in this workshop is minimum requirement number seven, which is flow control. So what is the purpose of flow control? We're trying to prevent an erosive flow range from occurring in our natural environment. So if you have a natural environment, then you add a bunch of land use, you add a bunch of impervious area, a bunch of roads. Now we're changing how that water is now running off back into the natural environment and the sedimentation that's now being carried into our stream. So by reducing the erosive flows, by using a mitigation facility and matching that pre-developed range, we can now simulate what it was like in that pre-developed environment. So we're not introducing extra sedimentation, extra pollution into the environment and damaging our streams in the long run. Um, V5.3 is the general design criteria for infiltration BMPs, which we're going to go into an infiltration uh, scenario here. And so that's where we're deriving those requirements for flow control. And then minimum requirement number is wetlands protection. We're not covering wetlands here, although we could talk for probably 10 hours about wetland protection. Um, you can contact, contact us if you have more questions about that. But we were, are mostly going to focus on minimum requirement number seven. But that's how WWHM 2012 helps you meet those minimum requirements. So the software 
off the get-go can help you meet all those different things. We're going to look at minimum requirement number seven uh, in this workshop. And so we're going to get into modeling. We're going to be modeling with chamber elements. We've been hearing a lot about people utilizing more and more chamber elements, especially also across the entire West Coast because of how development space is being utilized, how we need to be as efficient as possible. Chambers are being used a lot. So we thought it would be really productive in this workshop to take a look at a couple modeling scenarios involving stormwater chambers. This is going to be using the Princeco Hydro Store Chambers is what we're going to be using in this one. And you can download the beta link for the model, which is in the chat for WWHM 2012. It's a link there. And that will allow you access to these Princeco Hydro Store Chambers um, and begin modeling with those. So that's our agenda for this. Let me share a new screen now. So this should be WWHM 2012. Um, hopefully, uh, so I just have a couple of questions. Will the recording of this be available? Yes, it will. We're recording it right now and will be released later. Um, and we'll get some the, to the other questions at the very end. So now this is WWHM 2012. Can everyone see this screen? Just give me a couple of thumbs up. So I want to make sure I don't start modeling and no one can see what I'm actually modeling. So um, this is WWHM 2012. I got some thumbs up. Thank you so much. So we're going to model a flow duration scenario meeting minimum requirement number seven with a chamber element. So I open up the software here. This is WWHM 2012. How do we begin modeling? Well, first we need to select our project location, right? Just for this example, I'm going to be selecting this little spot right here. This is SeaTac uh, Airport, actually. And if I zoom in here using these plus and minus controls, you can actually see where your project area is. You can go in as far as the roadway. So you can see the roadmaps actually begin to form and you can see those there so if you're in king county you're probably even familiar with these areas here but you can use these map controls this gets you back to the extents control this one here uh, you can use the arrows to move up down right left uh, zoom in and out but you'll notice this little patch here is actually SeaTac airport it has a precipitation factor of 1.0 and it's using the SeaTac rain gauge so obviously in WWHM 2012 tons of counties you can select from depending on where your project is right but I'm just using this one for uh, this sample scenario here. So we selected King 2012. We've selected the SeaTac gauge. Now we're going to start building out our scenario here. So we're going to add some land use. And for this scenario, we're going to go real simple. We're going to assume that our pre-developed scenario was three acres of till force flat soil. Pretty standard there. I'm going to, by right-clicking, connect this base into the point of compliance. This is our point of analysis. So now we can analyze what the flow duration, flow frequency is for this pre-developed scenario here. We're gonna connect surface and interflow. We're not gonna to wanna to connect groundwater uh, for this instance. The standard is the surface and, and interflow. So now I go and I left click on run scenario and this is gonna generate, using that 60 plus years of rainfall data, it's gonna generate uh, that flow frequency result for us. So we can see what the range of flows we're working with is, and this is going to set essentially our criteria or our level for how we're going to try and match the mitigate scenario to the pre-developed scenario. So. This little graph icon here is the analysis tab. If we click on that and we go to point of compliance one, oh, so yeah, we can't look at the entire range yet because I haven't run the mitigate scenario, but it can then do a comparison of the pre-developed and mitigate scenario for your project run. So that's where we're going to go for the analysis tab. So I've now run the pre-developed scenario with basin one, three acres of till forest flat. Now we're going to look at our project development. And what exactly we're doing here. Let's say on this project site, we're tasked to turn all that till forest into one acre of roads. So we're going to add an acre of roads flat, an acre of roofs. So there's, there's going to be an entire acre of roofs on this one and an acre of sidewalk. So now we've replaced those three acres of pervious uh, forest flat till soil with impervious. And I'm going to connect the point of compliance here within the form of sidewalks, roofs, and roads. So now if I run the scenario, it's going to now generate what the mitigated flow frequency will look like. And then we will get a comparison and then we'll learn that we're going to need a mitigation facility, right? And that can come in many different forms and we're going to use chambers. We're going to use Princeco Hydro Store Chambers for this one here. So let's go to the analysis tab and select point of compliance one. And now it's going to run that analysis showing us, are we meeting the flow duration half the two year to the 50 year uh, flow range? Or are we not meeting that? And big shocker, we're not going to meet that. So um, we're going to need a mitigation facility, of course. And there's other ways we can meet it through infiltration, which I'll go through here as well. So you can see for the flow range, percent time exceeding, it's exceeding the entire time, right? So this fails massively. 
that was expected, right? You have a pre-developed forested area that rain is falling on, and then you have completely impervious area. Of course, there's going to be more runoff, right? So now what do we do? So we're going to disconnect the point of compliance, right? We didn't expect this to work, but now we need a mitigation facility. So we're going to use a chamber element here. I'm going to use the Princeco Hydro Store chamber element. And you can see uh, this form for the chamber element is very similar to the other forms we have for our mitigation facilities. Um, you, it has the downstream connections at the top here, you can see there. But just first off, I'm going to right click, connect this basin to this hydro store element and connect it to point of compliance because now that's where we're analyzing our flow frequency at. And you can see there's four chamber models to select from. And what's really great that Clear Creek Solution does is on every commercial element and on this hydro store element, we place some uh, links here where you can look and see more information about this element. So if I wanted more information, maybe you can't see that there. Um, let me share my internet tab just real quick. It opens up an external link and you can see, okay, these are the four chambers in the model. These are how these are represented um, and you can get some specs for them. So we have that link included there. So if you're looking to model with a chamber like element, um, we have the specs included. So you can take a look at that there. Let me go back to WWHM 2012 now. So those specs are included there. Um, so that's more information. And then we have, like I said, the Princeco specs. Let me share that uh, internet tab real quick here where you can get some real defined specs there. So we have those tabs included uh, in the modeling or in the element itself, I should say. Those are down there. Let's go over some of the components. So this is going to be easier if I quick if I click uh, Quick Chamber. So what Quick Chamber does, and with any other mitigation facility, it simply fills in values. This isn't doing any modeling. This is not adjusting to your project in any way. They're just values to fill in so that it could simply run. But this is not me actually modeling the facility yet. This is me showing you what the components are included. So this is the row length of the chambers facilities, the number of chambers you're actually going to have the number of end caps related to those chambers, and then the top stone depth and bottom stone depth, which you can look if you click the links on more information or the principal specifications, you can see exactly what um, that, that means in terms of row, uh, top stone depth and bottom stone depth. I'm just going to add those links to the chat one more time. So everyone should be able to see um, the, the beta link, the manual link, because that's some new people joined. So, um, I added those in there and then we can of course enable infiltration, which we'll do in the next scenario, but not for this one. Um, but you can see the outlet structure data here for height diameter type, which is being reflected in this, um, hydro store element. And then of course our orifice structure for if the water's heading out somewhere, which it is, in, which it is in this case. So that's a little small description. And then the chamber model, the one it defaults to is the HS180, which I said, if you go to the more information or you go to specifications, you can learn what exactly is the HS180. Does it fit your project needs? Does it not? You can learn about that there. So this is a description of the element. Now, what I'm going to do is I don't want to use that quick chamber that we just developed. Um, what I actually want to do is we're going to experiment a bit here, connect to point of compliance. I'm going to use the HS180. And what you could do is you could fill in all these values for what you think would work for your project. Maybe you have a designated amount of space. You've already mapped it out. Hey, I want this row length. I want these number of chambers, these number of eight, uh, end caps. And you know what you're doing. Great. Go for it. But for a lot of people, the model can actually utilize some of its uh, capabilities here to actually auto size your chamber in the most optimal function. So if you're just sizing your chamber, constantly messing with the row length, the number of chambers, see if you can get it correct. You might actually not be getting the most optimal facility. So what do we do? We can use something called auto chamber. And what auto chamber does, it allows us to optimally size that facility. I've selected the HS180. You can select a different chamber size or chamber model before you begin auto chamber, but we're going to go with the HS180 for this case. And then now that we're in auto chamber, we're going to slide this automatic slider and sizer all the way to the right for the most thorough analysis. Now, this used to be, um, you used to have to select what this was based on your computer's processing power. Basically, everyone has super powerful computers back, you know, compared to 2005 or something when WWHM first came out. So you don't need to worry about that. Slide this all the way to the right, and we're going to create a Princeco chamber. And so it will auto size this facility for us. This usually doesn't take too long, maybe five to 10 minutes, but it's well worth the wait because we now have an optimally 
size facility here. And so you can see that sort of run through its different iterations. And what you're going to see on the graph to the right here is the, it modifying the facility, the orifice size, and some of the components there to get that pre-developed flow curve to match, or I should say the mitigated flow curve to match that pre-developed flow curve, right? Because we can't have our flows exceeding in that erosive flow range. So it's a different thinking from single event where it's like, okay, we have a runoff event that we need to model for, and now we need a certain volume of facility with uh, orifices matching these three different events or something. No, we're actually trying to meet a release rate or a flow duration in the terms of percent, percent time exceeding in order to prevent that erosive flow range. So that is our goal here in Western Washington, and it's being adopted more and more along the West Coast. That is our goal with this model. And the only way to really map that out and match that flow duration is through continuous simulation, is through having that 60 plus years of rainfall data. And so while this kind of runs, let's see if we can find any questions that have been addressed. Joe's been addressing some questions in the chat. Thank you so much. Hopefully everyone is, is getting their questions addressed. I'm going to go back up. Um, and make sure I didn't miss it, miss anything. There's a lot of questions in there. So someone asked, um, do the different pervious surface options have different runoff coefficients associated with them? Um, so the pervious surface, so it's not really necessarily like a runoff coefficient in a single event way of thinking. Um, there's going to be different. I could open up the table. I can't open up while it's here, but there's, there's different uh, Perlin implant values for these different soil types, which actually determine how the hydrologic cycle interacts with each soil type. So it's not even broken down to as simple as a runoff coefficient. It's much more complex than that. And that's why continuous simulation is, oh, I, I, he corrected it to impervious. I'm sorry about that. So you corrected it, a uh, different runoff coefficients associated with impervious. So for impervious areas, they're basically all the same for the different slope categories. But when people like to submit projects or they're organizing their projects, they like to have the different kinds of impervious areas, which I totally understand. So, for example, sidewalks flat and roads flat, they're the same impervious area. You could put 10 acres in a roads flat and have those mean 10 acres of sidewalks flat. But a lot of time when people are modeling and they have a project with they have a bunch of roofs, they have a bunch of sidewalks and roads. They won't, don't want to have to parse that out again or if they're submitting it to the reviewer. And so that's why there's the different categories there. Is the different a difference in the runoff characteristics of different different impervious surfaces? It's just sort of as I explained, the different slopes are what's going to change um, how those interact or how the runoff is occurring. Hopefully, that makes sense to everyone. Um, let me go down here. Someone asked, does the quick chamber population values just use default values? Do they scale based on the size of the area you're trying to model? Um, no, they do not. It's the same values for everything. So quick chamber has nothing to do with your project. Just want to uh, make sure that's clear. So it's just going to be quickly uh, populate the values. No design criteria taken into account at all. Um, I want to make sure while this happens, we can answer some more questions. Joe's answering some questions there. Thank you so much. How do you view peak runoff values for storms like the two-year, five-year, and 25-year um, from the basin? Well, again, so it's not really a um, single event way of looking at things. Um, there are some graph values that you can find in the analysis tab if you want um, some sp specifics on that. But we're not trying to match like different storm return periods in this model. Someone said, I don't see any elements in the commercial toolbox section. Well, we have a video online that shows you how to add commercial elements to uh, your pro to WWHM 2012. So it does not default with um, commercial elements being a part of it because ecology, this is, um, you know, ecology helped develop WWHM 2012. They don't want to be sponsoring any uh, actual companies. So what you have to do is go to our website. We have in downloads there commercial elements. It's a video explaining how to do it. There's some text. There's an article there explaining how to do it. You'd have to download a file and place it in a folder on your computer, and then it'll turn on those commercial elements for you. So that's where you have to go to do that. It doesn't actually default to that. How do you get the commercial elements to show up? Someone had the same uh, comment. 
you have to go to our website and you have to do that little action first. So there's a video explaining it. It shows you the file to download, how to create the file, how to put it in um, the folder on your computer. And then next time you open the pro program, they should show up there. What jurisdictions recognize uh, this product? Depends on what you mean by this product. Um, WWH in 2012, all of Western Washington. Is it necessary to run the pre-developed scenario, mitigate scenario independently, or is it okay to input all the project constraints pre and post develop and then click run scenario? Well, you can input all your um, project variables in, but you do need to run each scenario separately to generate the results for that. So you need to run pre-developed, you need to run mitigated. Now, when you're auto sizing, it's doing that for you. But if you want results, then you have to um, do that there. Okay, good. Uh, so many great questions. Um, so now it's done auto sizing. So now we can see what kind of facility, what kind of Prince Hydro store chamber it developed for us now that it is done. So if we look here, we have a row length of 200 feet. We have uh, 450 chambers. There's 34 end caps, a part of that. We have a top stone depth of 12 inches and then a bottom stone depth of nine inches. You can see it's also designed our outlet structure for us and our orifice diameter tailored to our project setup and scenario. So if you're not utilizing auto sizing features on your project, this is a great way to get an optimally sized facility because this can take a long time to do manually, having to change all the components, run it, check flow duration, see where it's failing, go back, change it. This is why we have this feature in here for you. Um, so now we will go to the analysis tab and take a look. So now we can go to analysis. We can look at point of compliance one. Sorry, I'm also looking a bit at, at the chat. That's why I looked over there. I just want to make sure everyone's questions are being addressed as well. So now if we look at the analysis tab and we look at flow duration, um, we'll be able to see that this perfectly uh, matches the curve from our pre-developed flow and the facility passes. So we're now meeting minimum requirement number seven, which we just which we looked at at our PowerPoint for our flow duration. And so facility passes with flying colors. This is the pre-developed curve. This is the mitigated curve we're meeting easily. So that is a quick way to use a chamber element to meet minimum requirement number seven, which I think uh, you know is gonna be used on a lot of projects, obviously. So now, what if we need to utilize infiltration on our facility, right? What if we can't just meet flow duration? We have different kind of soils or something like that. Well, um, what I'm going to do here is uh, start a new WWHM 2012 project. No, I'm not going to save this one. Same sort of thing, but let's say we had some outwash soils. So now we have well infiltrating soils. We can't really meet flow duration now because all the soils being infiltrated and pre-developed, there's nothing really that we can... Now that well, now that we're going to add a bunch of impervious area to our mitigated facility or mitigated scenario, I should say, we're gonna have all this additional runoff. And then with outwash soils that are well infiltrated, we didn't really have that much runoff to begin with. We can't really mitigate it. We can't really meet it in that same sense. So I'm gonna select CTAC again. What I also want to show you here is um, if we go to view options, it'll show you these are the durations. So 50% of the two year to the 50 year is what we're trying to meet. It shows you right there. Um, we're going to go to our scenario now, add our land use basin once again. But now I'm looking at my scenario here. We have three acres of AB forest flat. So not, not till forest. We have outwash well infiltrating soils. Connect to point of compliance. We're going to run this. And then I'm going to show an infiltration scenario here. I'll make sure everyone's, looks like everyone's questions are being, we have a lot of questions. We'll have some time at the end as well, uh, of course. I want to remind everyone that um, this workshop is being recorded, so and it'll be posted again, so you'll be able to watch it. You don't need to record or stress about that. All this information will be available um, after we're done with the workshop. So we ran the pre-developed scenario there. Now let's go to mitigated. And so now on our project site, we've decided to leave one acre of our area untouched, just for this project scenario, right? This is just an example. And then we're going to add two acres of roads. We're going to connect this to point of compliance here. And I'm going to run the scenario. But because we have such well infiltrating soils, we're not going to be able to meet flow duration by just putting a mitigation facility in. We're going to have to 
get a little creative. And one of the ways we can do that is by infiltrating 100%. This is assuming that you're allowed to infiltrate, right? Obviously, project constraints are going to change dramatically based on your specific situation. But we're going to assume we're allowed to infiltrate into the soil. Disconnect POC. Now what we're going to do, we're going to use our hydro store chamber again. Connect there. Now what I'm intending to do here is actually infiltrate 100%. So I'm going to connect to point of compliance. I'm going to use quick chamber. This, like I said, this is just filling in values. So this is not, but this is what I'm going to use as my starting point per se, and then kind of modify it from there. So I'm going to turn infiltration on now. So notice it was off before we weren't infiltrating with the other scenario because you can't really infiltrate into you know till or hard soils or we can just say it wasn't allowed on our previous project let's say let's be generous let's say our measured infiltration rate is five inches per hour that's what geotech whoever was doing the test we've determined five inches per hour we're going to using using a reduction factor of two and then for a couple modifications for this infiltration scenario we're going to not have an orifice and then we're going to have a flat riser type for this one. So now I just want to see if I run this scenario, what the percent infiltrated is going to look like. So if we run it here, it'll tell us the total volume infiltrated, volume to the riser facility, and then the percent infiltrated. Now we just have a 200 by 200 facility. Will this work? Maybe. Is it too big? Uh, well, we're going to find out. So this is kind of the trial and error process uh, you have to go through. Yeah, so some people had questions about um, the orifice. The design engineer will need to evaluate the constructability of the orifice. Yes, so that's what Joe has to say about that. Okay, so we got 100% infiltrated with this facility. Great. That probably means we can make this smaller. So we can then, using our engineering judgment, maybe change the, the road length, the number of chambers, and run the scenario again. And so this is sort of the trial and error process that you have when running an infiltration facility. We know that in WWHM, the standard elements allow you to uh, auto size to an infiltration, right? To an infiltration target for uh, commercial elements and something like Prince Hydrostore, Hydro Store, you're going to have to use some engineering judgment to determine uh, how you wanna get that 100% infiltrated. But the good part is, is the software, these runs are pretty quick. And you can determine, okay, hey, we're still infiltrating 100%. Um, maybe you could select, maybe a better chamber model would now fit this scenario. And you could maybe change uh, the chamber model that you're using. Well, it's going to be back to, let's try 100, 100. Okay, so we're reducing our footprint here on this project because it's doing a, a real efficient job at infiltrating. Okay, so we're still getting 100%, right? So we could continue this process, or you could even uh, switch up the chamber model if you'd like. Let me see what the HS75, maybe that will work. Maybe that's a chamber size that will work, right? So this is kind of where your engineering judgment uh, kicks in, where you decide what kind of facility you need to use um, for your scenario here. While that's going on, maybe we can ad adjust some of the questions. So someone asked, aren't the correction factors from uh, Wash Data uh, or the Department of Ecology a fraction? Yes, they are. So it is a fraction, but then we put it in in the model as above one, and then it now becomes a fraction. Oh, um, Joseph? Yeah. No, it should be input okay. as a fraction. As a fraction, okay. All, all other, this is a new element. All other elements don't allow you to enter the value greater than one that check hasn't been put in for this particular okay. element. So that's something yeah. that will be fixed in the future. Okay. So it would be put in as 0.5 or something, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. Correct. Yeah. No, that, that was, so that was my year. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes. So it'll go in as 0.5. So let's run this again then in, in light of that. Um, sometimes I get that mixed up uh, in my head. So it says, if you're infiltrating, do you need to run 
a pre-development scenario. Um, that I guess that depends on the. Can oh, hold on, let's look. So, yeah, so the facility wasn't big enough, so we need to increase the size of the facility there. But everyone sort of gets the um, idea when it comes to modeling with infiltration. So we still are meeting our percent, one hundred percent. Uh, target there. But that is, we're trying to outline, right, we can't uh, exactly match your project situation there, but that is the intent and the process when we're modeling with infiltration. Um, yeah, make sure you use a fraction there with uh, that reduction factor. So those are two different modeling scenarios, which I'll go back to our slides in a second. Those are two different modeling scenarios using chamber elements, one where you can use uh, it for to meet the flow duration just directly, and then another one for using it to infiltrate 100%, right? And then meet the flow duration that way because we had outwashed soils, right? We weren't out able to use it in the same sort of typical way. So those are two different modeling scenarios there. So. Okay, everyone should be able to see the presentation, right? So you can download that WWHM 2012 link that was in the chat there if you like to also model with that Prinsco Hydro Store chamber element. So this is just outlining, hey, we met the flow control standard. We, it, you know, it failed before without the facility. And now that we added the facility, we now meet flow control. And then now we're able to meet that 100% infiltration target with the facility as well. So this is the basic contact information that uh, for if you want to talk to Ecology directly, but Clear Creek Solutions manages WWHM 2012. Uh, we take a lot of the comments and questions people have about the software. If you're ex experiencing a specific bug or you have a, a clarification question that you need on the software, this that's a great place to uh, contact uh, any of us there on Clear Creek Solutions. You can also fill out a, a, a contact form. And now we will go into, I want to make sure everyone's questions were addressed. In the modeling, we seem to have a lot of questions there. Joe answered some in the chat. Um, as well. So I want to make sure I get to everyone's here uh, in the chat because people probably have uh, quite a few questions. So let me go through. Make sure I didn't miss anyone's theirs. Um, also, there seems to be a lot of people. So um, I don't know who wants to ask a question verbally as well, if they might be able to um, articulate their question better that way. Um, but go ahead, I guess you could raise your hand and then we can allow you to speak if you wanted to ask a question that way as well um, as I look through the chat. So let me see if anyone is raising their hand or has a question. If you want to learn more about the the model, the elements we use today, the Prince Hydro Store elements, you can go to, um, there's a QR code there. There's a contact information there if you want to learn more about the Hydro Store element and get a customized uh, lunch and learn for you. So... Doesn't seem to be anyone raising their hand or who wants to ask a question. So, okay, I have a, what versions are available for purchase and what versions are free for downloading from the DOE website? Oh, we had a question there. Are you referring to WWHM 2012? Um, WWHM 2012 is free, so there's no purchase version um, for that. It's it's provided. Um, I'm going to ask what is the difference between the beta version and what is on Ecology's website. So this version, um, that the beta version allows us to make changes quickly to the software because there's sort of more time for review and things when Ecology releases uh, their version parallel as well. We want to get a version to users that will either include new elements or include uh, certain bug fixes or things like that. So that's the that's the difference. There's no major differences, but it just allows us to get uh, a more updated version to uh, users quicker. So I'm going to ask, is the pre-developed total basin area always equal to the mitigated total basin area? Um, and I would say 99.9% .9 of cases, yes, because the, the project area should be the same. Um, even if we're using bypass areas, we're using something else, those areas should total to be the same. Are commercial elements no charge? In terms of adding the commercial elements to your software, yes, there are no charge. So um, you just go to our website and you're able to add them uh, there. I kind of outlined before, if you go to downloads, there's how to add commercial elements. Um, and then there, you're, uh, there's a video instructing you on how to do it. And there's um, an article there outlining how to add them. So yes, it's free. I, I'm gonna answer the question on the 
infiltration. Yeah, yeah go for it. Yeah, so the the last tenth of a percent or sometimes one percent to get to 100% infiltration can increase the size of your facility quite a bit. And basically what it is, is it's trying to infiltrate the largest event on record. And sometimes that's a really big event and, and can expand the size of your facility quite a bit. Um, rainfall intensity factored. Um, rainfall intensity, it's historical data. It's the real data that has occurred for the last 60 years. So um, whatever was measured, that's the intensity. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Um, in terms of the chamber product being approved um, by ODOT or WashDOT, uh, I don't actually know the answer to that particular question. I'm sure uh, HydroStore, if you contact them directly, can tell you. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, we're just. Uh, well, Seattle. Seattle has 158 year five minute time step time series that they mandate we use. And that slows everything down quite a bit. Now with that, they also use a different flow frequency methodology than the standard DOE methodology of log Pearson. Um, let's see. Someone says the HSPF updates are sometimes printed in the PDF and other times not. Are PDF printing issues being worked on? The so the latest, ver there's been a number of issues addressed in the PDF report um, that are in the version that you download as a beta, but are not officially uploaded to the DOE yet. We're working with DOE because we're also working to upload a brand new version for them based on the new 2024 manual. So there's been some delay in some of the fixes that have been for DOE. So someone asked, is the rock above and below the chambers included as storage? Yes, it is. So someone after the reporting, there were some people asking questions about reporting, I guess. Um, there. Yeah, so out, what, outflow one is always the structure. Two is infiltration. There are a couple elements where you want to route infiltration downstream. They're water quality elements that all they're doing is filtering. But for nearly all of them, um, outflow one is the only thing you want to use to meet. And that's by default what is selected whenever you connect to a point of compliance. So, so the someone asks, is there a hundred year rainfall event in the rainfall record? If you if you study each record for each location and each scaling factor, once in a while there are some events that come out to be equal to or greater than what is computed to be the hundred year volume. Um, but for the most part, and since there's less than a hundred years of data, there's less, there's not likely to be a hundred year event in there. Um, it just depends on from gauge to gauge, location to location and scaling factor to scaling factor on whether or not that's the case. Um, what you have is the actual data. And then we do a flow frequency analysis to determine your target flows. And then you have to duration match for those targets and you're only matching to a 50 year anyways. So the hundred years, not, not something you're even required to match. So someone commented meeting flow control requirements does not necessarily mean 100% infiltration. No, cause you're, you're only required to infiltrate, you know, whatever agree there, it can vary on every jurisdiction. But if you infiltrate 100%, you will meet flow control because there'll be no discharge. If you infiltrate less than that, you're allowed to have a discharge, but it can be very difficult to meet if your pre-developed uh, land use type is an AB or an outwash, then uh, that's why you have to infiltrate. So you can have a partial infiltration solution as long as you still meet flow control. Um, someone commented, I thought this would be good. AB Forest has an infiltration default rate of two in the soil parameters. C Forest has a rate of 0.08, and Sap Forest has a rate of two. 
are those soil parameters inches per hour and should you edit them to match field no so those are hspf calibrated parameters and the two that is there for ab soil for example does not mean two inches per hour it's actually uh, an infiltration index that's part of a series of algorithms that actually determine infiltration based on the uh, previous time step and the future time step and the rainfall that's falling and the tracking of the soil moisture over time. That's why HSPF is used is because it tracks all of the different soil moisture parameters from time step to time step. And so your infiltration rate will increase and decrease based on a whole bunch of other factors. So you should never change those parameters unless specified by the jurisdiction. Otherwise, you should just leave them. Will the option to reduce freeboard to 0.5 feet in lieu of the forced one foot when utilizing auto tank become available? Uh, right now, there's no plans to change the default freeboard for auto tank. Um, if you size something and you get done, and you're allowed to use a half a foot of freeboard, then you design it to have a half a foot of freeboard. I mean, freeboard is freeboard, right? It's just on the top. So um, auto size uses one for a whole number of reasons, but that's just the default it has. Then can you provide us tips on how to meet minimum requirements seven and eight if it is not feasible to meet both? Do jurisdictions prefer meeting uh, minimum requirement number eight over minimum requirement number seven? This has changed from jurisdiction to jurisdiction on which one they determine is the most important. Most often, they choose the wetland protection and criteria over the floateration, but I've had both. So that that really, when you enter into that um, catch-22, where you have two different criteria that are not necessarily um, complementary, that you have to meet, you need to work that out with the jurisdiction that you're you're that is regulating you. Okay, good. Um, is there guidance on the hydrologic inputs, specifically on accounting for effective impervious area versus total impervious? In the case of design, when you're building you're doing a development, there is no effective impervious area factor. That's a factor that you use when doing watershed design or calibrations or a whole bunch of other things. But DOE Department of Ecology requires that you use your actual impervious area. So someone asked, uh, is it possible to adjust riser height with the uh, principal hydro store element, rock above or below? Sorry, the thing is blocking. To be included in detention volume depends on the option to adjust height of the riser. So the riser height is, is when you do the auto sizing is set. And if there's more rock above it, then there's more rock above it. It's all part of the stage area storage discharge table. Um, you can manually make adjustments to your riser height afterwards, wherever you want to put it. Um, there are too many different permutations of things to include every option in auto sizing. So yeah. um, that's the way that is. So someone has stated that the 2019 ecology manual actually states that minimum requirement eight is the priority. Um, that's <laughs> probably accurate, but also jurisdictions sometimes have different um, yeah. Recommendations, <laughs> I should say. Check with your jurisdiction. Uh, let's see here. I just want to make sure we're addressing everyone's questions. Can you explain the use of linear developed basins, e.g. run sidewalks into grass strips? Oh, so like uh, la lateral basins, right? would would that what you're referring to um yeah so essentially you can run different lateral basins into each other with different lengths use them as dispersions um i guess i need a more detailed question but yeah you can use lateral basins for that the permeable pavement pro element is specifically an element to to mimic permeable pavement when it does that it creates 
a porous pavement um, implant or in the that shows up in your basin, but you're not allowed to use that and you shouldn't use that because that's just part of the permeable pavement element. Each permeable pavement element you use creates a new a new porous pavement implant. So you should not use the one in the basin. I don't think you're even allowed to, but um, you should definitely just use the porous pavement element. Um, with a detention pond, is it okay for the riser to be lower than the design water surface 50 year, as long as the pond meets flow control standards per yes. WWE results? Simply yes. You're, if, if it meets the flow duration, you're fine. Okay, good. Those are all great. Great questions. Hopefully, hopefully we're addressing everyone. So uh, a lot here. Auto Vault, Auto Vault and Auto Pond and all the autos, they do not limit the notch width or orifice size, even though it goes below that which is allowed. And it doesn't do that because once you limit it, you limit its ability to find better or more efficient solutions. And you'll often it'll often stop way before it should because it couldn't change that. When you get all done, you're an engineer. If you decide that's too narrow, you switch your design or you try and make a, a fatter width notch design, maybe with that's shorter and not as long, you know, work. That's that's up to you to make an adjustment with. Orifice you let, and you might end up with a two tenths of an inch orifice, which is below the five tenths you're allowed. And DOE just says, that's fine you know, design it according to that two tenths of an inch. But then when you put that or orifice in, put it in at half an inch. That's just what they do. This is a good one here. Any thoughts on how to best model turf fields? So turf fields usually have um, gravel and an underdrain. Um, sometimes they infiltrate, but most of the time it's gravel with an underdrain. So really what you have with a turf field is a giant porous pavement. Okay. And so you can model it as a porous pavement element um, and just make sure you set your your depths correctly for each of the different layers. When is new impervious considered not effective impervious and how can you model that related to lateral basins? So if you if you you if you have a rooftop that drains onto a yard, now you're doing dispersion, right? And if you're doing dispersion, then you're allowed, according to the manual, to uh, either model it directly or use particular certain credits with the dispersion as long as you have the minimum length flow path. So those that's how you would deal with that. Otherwise, impervious is always effective. Okay. So does permeable pavement have to be modeled as a lateral basin versus infiltration trench per LID PSAY? So permeable pavement have to be modeled as a lateral basin versus infiltration trench. So permeable pavement, the element, is actually a lat. It, it's two elements put together that you don't see. The top one is a lateral impervious element that's connected to the um, gravel trench bed. And so um, that's what it is. And so it, it's, you know, already modeled as a lateral basin automatically. They stated that PSAT recommends uh, infiltration trench. So, but. Yeah, an infiltration that. trench, like I just mentioned, is one of the two elements of porous pavement, permeable pavement. So you know, modeling it as a gravel trench and modeling as a permeable pavement in essence are the same thing. So it just depends on if you do model it as a gravel trench, then you have to make sure that you you include the area for that as an impervious <laughs> entry in your basin that connects to it, which then gives you the equivalent of permeable pavement. So does WWHM generate a report that consultants can use as a deliverable for the AHJ or do results usually get coupled with a storm report? Resorts usually get coupled with a storm report. Um, it's usually an attachment or um, an appendix or something like that, um, most typically. 
you have to if you asked the question earlier and I just there were so many I didn't get to it, you can go ahead and put it again if you'd like, but I think gotten to almost there anyone, uh, everyone. What I notice is that there's no depth available with lateral pavement. Um block sorry, it's blocking your chat with lateral pavement versus the trench. Is that what you said? Uh, so lateral if you use yeah, versus the trench. if you use the um if you're talking about a lateral pavement element that's different lateral flow impervious is different than using um permeable pavement with with permeable pavement you have thicknesses for each layer with lateral impervious that's just a lateral impervious surface there's no trench associated with that um, I just want to clarify because someone asked about the chamber product and its approval. Um, someone say that it does not appear that WashDOT nor ODOT have requirements for retention detention chamber approval. If needed, we'd recommend using ASTM 2418. So that's clar clarity on that. We have a lot of questions about using pumps. <laughs> pumps are very, very complicated and very yeah. difficult because HSPF and therefore WWHM is not a hydraulics model. And it's it's possible to do. It can be included. Um, it's very complicated. And uh, once in a while, we'll help somebody. They'll contact us, and we'll help them do it. Um, but yeah, it's it's difficult to include pumps. Um, there's a simple way to include a pump if you just accept that you have a pump curve that is stage discharge related. Then you use the SSD table to represent the pump, and you can use multiple common co columns to represent individual pumps or when a pump turns on or turns off. That's the short answer on that. So someone said, I've noticed that after multiple runs of the mitigated scenario, when I'm altering the parameters of the storm solutions, the analysis results can tend to get skewed. I tend typically have to restart the program, re-input my basin values before continuing. So I, I would need to see an, an actual example of what you're talking about. Um, I mean, I'm not sure what parameters you're adjusting in that particular case that is causing it to get, you know, skewed. But I, I can assure you, I've run thousands of different projects hundreds of times, and I, I've not had that particular scenario. So I'd yeah. like to know what you're doing to reach that problem. Yeah, if you're having a particular error, or you think something's wrong with something, the best way is to contact us and provide us with the .whm file, because then we can take a look at the project directly. Um, so you can contact, contact us at clearcreeksolutions.com slash contact and go ahead and, and begin, a begin con uh, talking with us and we can help you with that. We'll probably have time for, uh, three or four more questions. Um, the PDF print defaults to log Pearson, uh, in lieu of Gring Gorton. Is that the altered result? If that's the altered results. So other than. I think Seattle, and I might be wrong because I don't, I'm not contacted by every jurisdiction in Western Washington on a regular basis to inform me of changes they've made to their manuals. But um, Seattle's the only one I'm aware of that Green Gorton's used, but um, the rest of it is ecology requires Log Pearson. So that's what's default used and that's what will show up in the report. That's what you're using. There's been an adjustment made to the report in the beta version for dealing with Seattle so that it'll report Gringerton in the Seattle area. Most of the time, those things, those changes happen and we don't even know they've happened until someone tells us. And then we, and then we can, we're not really even paid to make those updates. Um, so it's something we just end up doing for free, but it, you know, it'd be nice if, if we were notified and, and we're able to make the changes they wanted. So when I asked, uh, can runoff from up basin be accounted for, or is it just the rain falling on the specific site? I'm not sure what up basin um, means. You can account Upst for upstream. Is it? I mean, upstream? you can put upstream basins. You can have uh, anything connected to pretty much anything in the model. Um, so uh, I think maybe I understand this question now. So all the basin area were basically determining the model that rain is falling on the entire basin area. So 
you have three acres of forest flat, it's all treated the same and the rain is falling on that amount of area. Does that, hopefully that makes sense. Um, makes sense. Okay, great. Um, yeah. And if anyone has, because it looks like we're getting close to wrapping up, we want to be conscious of people's time. If anyone has a follow-up question, go ahead. I would contact me at brasherjr at clearcreeksolutions.com. Um, if you had a comment or email or something, uh, your question didn't get answered, whatever uh, happened, just go ahead and email me there and we can uh, start a correspondence there. So we just want to give people as much clarity as possible on these topics because sometimes they can uh, they can be complicated. So um, a lot of people um, thought it was helpful. Great. I'm glad it was helpful. Um, again, I'll, I'll mention uh, this will all be reposted. You'll be able to watch this um, in the future. Uh, we'll send out an email with it there. It'll be on our YouTube channel so people will be able to view it uh, for all for all eternity <laughs> and help with their stormwater. So uh, we want to thank you, everyone. We can probably maybe take one more question, but it looks like we're wrapping up. A lot of people, um, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank everyone for attending. We want to thank you guys as well. So because this helps us determine what people are struggling with, what people are thinking about, and how we can address and uh, make things better for the next version. So um, anyways, I'll stick around for a few few more minutes. But um, that was what we had planned for today. Um, hopefully everyone has a good afternoon. Um, thank you for Joe for popping on as well um, and answering some questions for us. So um, thank you from, yeah, thank you everyone. I um, uh, hope everyone has a good afternoon. So like, like I said, at this point, if your question didn't get answered or your comment uh, didn't get answered, go ahead, just email me and uh, we'll, we'll start a correspondence there. So.